presentation on device agnostic content strategy for deploying. Um, so I tried to make the, the name of the presentation really pretentious, like not just mobile content strategy, but device agnostic. Because who knows what kind of uh, what kind of devices will be designing content for in the near future. Um, and uh, so I hope you're all in the right place. Uh, content strategy. Are there people in the room who are content strategists? A few people. Just a couple hands. Maybe maybe by the end of this presentation we'll see uh, all the hands, all the hands in the air. So if you're not if you're not a uh, content strategist, then what do you do? Are you uh, site builders? Like Drupal site builders? A few hands. Who here has like made a content type or a new Drupal? Okay. So you're all you're all site builders. That's awesome. Anyone here like a, a real developer, like back end folks? For anyone front end folks, like CSS, HTML, maybe some project managers. So in fact, even if you're not uh, really like considering yourself a content strategist, you might actually be uh, a content strategist, <laughs> or or maybe you should be. So uh, in this presentation, I'll be kind of touching on that and trying to um, to bring everyone into the fold of like content strategy minded people. Uh, just as an introduction before I start, my name is Suzanne Vergachova. So I work at Evolving Web for a Drupal shop based in Montreal, just uh, down the road. Um, and I do a lot of Drupal training. Um, I also have experience doing theming and module development and site building. So I've done a lot of, of Drupal things over the years. Um, and if you want to follow me because you want to know my thoughts on on Drupal type things, you can follow me on Twitter at Suzanne underscore Kennedy. Um, we work for lots of different types of clients. Got a couple more slides here. And we have some trainings coming up. So uh, sorry for the for the promo pitch before the presentation, but if you if you are interested in uh, training on Drupal, we've got some trainings coming up actually in Ottawa in um, in September. So feel free to come talk to me afterwards about that, or I've got some handouts at the back that you can pick up if you want more info. Okay, so let's dive right in. So I only saw a few hands, people saying they were content strategists. So that probably begs the question, like, what is, what is content strategy anyway? So when I think of content strategy, I often think about, like, storytelling. So if you're looking at a website, um, not just necessarily publishing the content that you happen to have uh, that you think needs to go online, but actually making that content into something that's a bit more uh, compelling. So connecting users to the content and making it engaging for them. So sometimes that means changing the structure of the content, changing how it's laid out, changing the architecture, like the types of content that we actually create. Um, it can mean all sorts of things. So storytelling is like a really nice, friendly word, like, oh yeah, everyone loves storytelling. Um, but from a more business perspective, of course, there's also often a marketing intent behind content. So uh, on the one hand, you want to make content engaging for the users so that the users are happy and they're satisfied with the content and they, they want to stay on your site and um, read or look at what you have to present. And then from a marketing perspective, you also want to achieve some business goals, like Maybe you want somebody to see a piece of content so that they'll go and buy something or they'll contact you or there's some kind of call to action there that, that you want to take place. Um, and then at the same time, sometimes your organization might just have a mandate to make content available. So especially when we're thinking of like uh, government websites or public organizations, a lot of time the content just has to be there, maybe even from a legal perspective. So making that content available and accessible to people so that they can find it easily, that's part of content strategy too. So it's really like uh, a, a meeting point between users and, um, and business goals. That's where we find good content strategy. So that's content strategy in general. And then when we're talking about content strategy across devices, like for mobile or for for, for um, desktop or for any kind of device in between or thinking out of the box like other kinds of future devices you might want to put content on. How does content 
strategy apply there? Um, so when you're thinking of your content strategy in general, you want to remember that that content might be used by all types of different devices, so you want that to be able to, to adapt well. So if you have especially long form content, it might present really well on a, on a big device, but then as soon as you put it on a small device, it's going to, it's going to be harder to uh, consume for the, for the user. So, so thinking ahead in that perspective. Um, making content consistent across devices. So if you've ever looked at a website and then tried to use it on your phone and not being able to find the content you're looking for, that's one of the most frustrating user experiences. So making sure that you can access content um, across devices is important. Uh, giving users clear pathways, that's a really important goal to content strategy in general. And on different devices, that can be, uh, again, a big challenge, is, is giving users those um, click-through points so that they can not just find the content that they land on on a given page, but actually find related content. Um, and then just another goal in general with content strategy is uh, solving problems in the content rather than trying to fix things with design. So sometimes when we take a website and we try and make it work across devices, we start dealing with the design to kind of compensate for the content. Like we say, oh, there's all these tables, so let's just change how the tables look so that they work better on mobile. Um, but if you're really implementing a good content strategy, you'll try and fix those content problems rather than just you know, moving pixels around a little bit with your CSS. So for thinking of really high level goals, um, we want to make sure that with content strategy, we have important content first. So I think the, the accessibility session was, was here just before. Often in accessibility, we talk about the same kind of goal, like making sure that our content is really semantic, um, and then letting the design just take care of the display. Uh, so that's one good overall goal to have. And then um, um, letting the design, um, yeah, letting the design change the content according to the screen resolution, um, according to the browser capability or the speed, um, but not kind of making those assumptions right out of the back when you're designing how the content is going to be structured. So just basically separating out your design from the the logical presentation of the content. So some techniques. So those are kind of high level goals and how are we actually going to, to achieve this? So with Drupal, there's obviously lots that we can do on the site building side to change how content is organized. Um, and so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is structuring your content in a controlled and granular way. So if you're at the beginning of your, your Drupal project and you're trying to build those content types or other entity types and uh, figuring out how those should map to the content that you have. Um, that's really going to impact your content strategy and your content strategy across devices. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, keeping the navigation simple. So navigation is, is a huge thing um, for content strategy. It's one of the main ways people are going to explore your site. And it's also one of the key things that's challenging um, across devices. Having clear paths to content, so beyond navigation, there might be other pathways to kind of lead users from one piece of content to another. Um, optimizing the use of media, so beyond just text, you often have lots of images and videos, and um, that can be a huge challenge across devices. Um, and in content strategy in general, you have to keep in mind that media is also crucial to, the, to your content. Um, and cleaning up legacy HTML. So we, I'm going to talk about that at the end. Uh, if you've got a lot of content that doesn't fall into any kind of uh, real information architecture, how do you handle that in the course of your project? Okay, so I'm going to start off with content structure. And this is a fun one because Drupal handles uh, structuring content so well. Like when we think of Drupal as a content management system, 
if you've been using Drupal for years, you might just take for granted the fact that you can build content types and do really cool things with, with content structure. But if you're new to Drupal, and for how many people is this year, like, you're fairly new to Drupal, like, maybe this is your first Drupal event. Okay, so there's a bunch of you who are new to Drupal, so maybe you'll get really excited about this because Drupal is super flexible when it comes to setting up content structures. So our goal is with structuring content. We want to make sure that content is, is semantic. Um, so we want to be stripping out any kind of design elements from the content itself and just adding those in afterwards. Um, and in terms of the content structure, we want to make sure that when you're looking through the content, and this is before you're even adding a design, just in the way the content is structured, we want to allow for skimmability and readability. So you might think, like, if I'm not the designer, how can I make the content skimmable and readable? Well, the best way to do it is to allow the, the designer to make the content skimmable and readable by breaking it up into chunks. So really making the content granular so that it can be, um, it can be presented in a way that users can distinguish between different ideas within the flow of, of the content. Um, and that's what leads to like, storytelling, right? Like if you've got different pieces of content, someone can just kind of look through it and see what's there, rather than having to read every, every piece of text. So guidelines for structuring content. So right off the bat, and this might seem like a, an obvious one, but breaking down the content into individual fields is, is really key. So if you have a lot of content on an existing site that's long form, that's just like big dumps of HTML, breaking that up into a separate field for different components, different text components even, can be really powerful. Because it means that you can present it in a more, um, in, in a more uh, granular way. Uh, making fields required. So again, this might seem obvious, but if you have different content types, uh, and you don't make fields required, then when authors are creating the content, they might very well leave things out. Um, and that makes content less consistent and less easy for people to consume. It also makes it harder to do that storytelling thing I'm talking about because you, you, can't, um, you can't rely on the fact that uh, a chunk of content is there. So for example, if you have, uh, if you have a lot of, let's say you have a lot of events events on your website, and you don't make all the fields required, so some of the events have locations, and some of them don't, and some people take that location data and they just put it in, into the body text. Like, that's kind of a, an obvious one, but that can make the content really inconsistent. So on one page, you have this really beautiful way of displaying the location, and then another event page, you, you don't you just have it alongside the rest of the text. So making fields required is going to automatically just make your content strategy more successful. Um, sometimes it's challenging to make fields required because you want to give flexibility for the author. Um, but just, just so you know, there's a, always a drawback of doing that. Uh, ordering fields in a logical way. So when you're actually displaying content on the page, before you get to the design part where you have some things uh, emphasized, maybe some things grayed out, some things displayed on the right or the left, you want to make sure that the actual order, like in the, in the DOM, in the HTML that's being printed, you want to make sure that that order is, is logical. So again, if you have like an event, event piece of content, you want to make sure that the title of the event is first. Um, probably the date is the next most important thing. And you want to go through and make sure that that initial ordering is, is making sense. Um, current CSS practices allow us for a ton of flexibility in how we lay out and order content visually. So you just want to focus on first the semantics of what's most important. Uh, limiting the length of text components. So if you just, again, if you just have one big body text, you're gonna end up with something really long. Um, but if you're able to break that up into smaller components, that's gonna make it easier to read. So one example there um, uh, would be like a learning, a learning website where someone has a lot of 
information to consume, and rather just rather than just uh, presenting like a whole bunch of information that someone has to to read, you might break that up into sections, and maybe it's kind of arbitrary. Maybe you say, okay, each section is going to be called a, a, a component or a pathway on this on this page, and then the author is going to enter in a title and syntax for each one. Um, but by breaking those into separate fields, it means that on the design side, you can visually separate the page and make it make it easier uh, for the user. Uh, okay, so one example of um, how you can use granular content to your advantage for different devices. This is the exact same like recipe data on a mobile size device and on a bigger device. And um, just the fact that you have separate ingredient and instruction fields means that on a mobile you can, you can hide a lot of the data. Um, you can make it easier for the user to flip between one, one view, like list of ingredients versus instructions. Um, it also means you can hide less important information. So if you have something that's less essential, you can, you can reduce that, like here the nutritional information. Um, so just, just the display of data is able to be condensed on, on a different device. So the more fields you have, the more flexibility you have in, in the display. Uh, long form content has its own uh, challenges. So if you're starting off with existing content and there's just a really long bits of text, like maybe you have academic articles uh, or just descriptions that are, are lengthy, um, it can be really challenging, especially if there's a WYSIWYG that's used to manage that content. So how many of you are using WYSIWYGs on your site? And how many people have faced issues with WYSIWYGs? Like you turn the WYSIWYG off a lot. <laughs> Yeah, so WYSIWYGs can be challenging just because uh, when you're using a WYSIWYG, you're creating a lot of HTML without really knowing what that HTML is. And over the years, that can build up to a lot of um, complex HTML. Uh, and often, that content is better served by separate fields. So in Drupal 8, one um, technique for doing this, for taking this long form content and breaking it up, is using a module called Paragraphs. Has anyone used the Paragraphs module yet? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Paragraphs is often used just for creating compound fields. There's lots of use cases for this. I'll, I'll throw out a couple examples. So let's say we have events on our website, and we want to have multiple dates when the same event is occurring. So one way to do that would just be to say, okay, if you have lots of event dates, just type that information into the body text. And you get this big, long body text with all this, these event details. Um, but a better way to do that is to actually structure that content. So using something like paragraphs, you can design like a sub-content type for each event for an event instance. And then that event instance can have the, the date, it can have the location, um, and then that's its own entity that's being printed out on the page, which you can style differently. So it gives a lot more control to the designer to make that presentation really uh, useful on, on mobile versus on, on other devices. Um, uh, and then that same technique, event date instances for, for uh, events, that could be used also just for long form text. So let's say you have an article, but it's a very lengthy article, and you want to have different sections with, um, with a unique kind of display, you can create a paragraph just for like an article section with a title and a body. And that might seem like overkill for just a, a lot of text, but it means that your presentation is going to be really consistent. Like all those titles are going to be displayed the same way. The designer can quickly go in and change the, the font, change the display of those titles, and not have to go in and update all the content that was together. So identifying those opportunities to make those different uh, types of fields, that's kind of the job of the content strategist. So those are the types of things you're probably going to be looking for when you go through and analyze um, the site and, and what the needs of the site are. 
Okay, so that's like individual content types. Uh, obviously, making content granular is important. Um, once you're actually putting the site together, you're going to be also thinking about navigation. So how is content related to each other? You've got different content types, but how does the user actually find the content that they're looking for? Uh, so in navigation, uh, some of these things are pretty obvious. Prioritizing important menu items if you're building a main navigation. Um, uh, and removing unneeded ones. So that might seem obvious, but there's, uh, it can be quite challenging, right? If you're, you're building a site and you're trying to, uh, to remove things from an existing menu, or you're trying to figure out what goes first in the menu. Um, but this is really key, and uh, maybe one way to kind of sell it at your organization is to talk about different devices. Because as soon as you try and take a uh, navigation that's large and make it work on mobile, it's going to be a huge challenge. So the flatter your navigation is, the, the, easier, the easier it's going to be to make it work across devices. Um, and sometimes a technique for this is going to be breaking up a menu into separate, menu, separate menus for uh, maybe some less important content. So that also involves prioritization. Um, not relying on mega menus, so I think, again, in the presentation before this, uh, there's a discussion of how challenging it is to make mega menus accessible. It's also really challenging to make them work on, on mobile. So for example, everyone knows what I'm talking about with a mega menu, like you scroll over and you just see like, it's not just like a drop down, it's like this massive amount of content in the menu. Um, and often with mega menus, what happens is there's actually important content, like pathways to content that you can only access through the menu. Um, and so they kind of take the place of landing pages almost in terms of organizing a section of the site. So it's great to have mega menus, but you really can't rely on them for, for navigation because on mobile, you're going to be forced to simplify them. So I see mega menus as more of like an enhancement of a user interface and not something that you can say is like essential to the site. Um, using calls to action to augment or replace menus can be really interesting. So if you're trying to flatten a menu and figure out like, okay, I want to take things out of the menu, but how are people going to access these pages? Um, having really clear calls to action, like large buttons and um, links to related content on a page can be a really good replacement for menu items. And uh, the, the reason it, it's, it's useful is that on, on mobile, menus tend to be less visible. Like we have to collapse menus a lot of the time. Uh, and so a call to action is actually going to be a more effective way of getting somebody into a, a related page or a separate page. Um, I say place all content within the, the navigation hierarchy. So that's kind of like the reverse of what I just said. Uh, <laughs> should probably be like all, all key content. So don't, um, if you have a navigation hierarchy and that's where the user goes to figure out like what are the most important things on the site, don't leave out like the most important page. So if you've got like a big fat donation button and that's what you want people to do on the site, make sure that that's present in, in that navigation interface. Okay, so some examples. Um, we look at navigation on mobile. We often really see the complexity of the navigation. So sometimes when you open up like a navigation interface, you're actually seeing lots of different menus appearing. Sometimes you're seeing nested menus, like on this, in this screenshot. And here I wasn't able to fit the whole menu into the screenshot. You know, it just goes to show how much uh, content there is in there. Um, and remember, these are the types of menus that are being used because somebody lands on a page, they're not on exactly the right page, and now they need to figure out where are they in the site, where do they want to go. It's what they're using uh, mostly for pathfinding through, through the site. So if there's something that you can do to uh, highlight certain items, just reduce the size, or uh, in this case, like we've got a couple of menus here that are kind of the same. Um, this is more on the design side, but you want to have that, uh, that, uh, 
you want the user to be able to distinguish between different parts of the site here. And uh, in terms of content strategy, if you can simplify this on the content strategy side, it just makes the design a whole lot easier. Uh, and here's one site, the WWF site, which I think does this really, really well. It's got uh, a very simple navigation. Um, a lot of the uh, additional pages are linked to through calls to action, um, but they're very consistent about the display of the, the key pages on their site that they want to direct users to. And that's just made possible by having a simple site structure to begin with. Um, one thing I just want to point out specifically for Drupal, so if you're working on content strategy and you're building out your navigation, your primary goal, just like with content, um, content structuring, is to make sure that the menu makes sense. So you want your menu structure to start with to make sense. So if you've got multiple levels of your menu, but it's the same, um, like the concept of the menu is the same, you want to put those things into a single menu. Um, and the way then that you display that is incredibly flexible. So if you've been working with Drupal 8 and you've been placing blocks with Drupal 8, you'll know that there's settings in the block placement for a menu, or you can choose what levels you're printing out, you can choose what levels are displayed. So on the display side, it's incredibly flexible. So you want to make sure that in terms of just the, the menu itself, that the structure makes sense. So don't try and worry about the display of the menu when you're building the menu. You worry about the display of the menu when you're placing the blocks and doing the design part. Um, but just in terms of how you're storing menu items and the parent menu items, make sure that that makes sense to start with. So menu placement, like I said, super flexible. Start off with the logical part of like what belongs in the menu, what doesn't, what should the structure be. Okay, so navigation is important for uh, getting users to the right content, but there's other methods of um, getting the user uh, to the right place. So content pathways that we can that we can uh, consider. So calls to action. How many here are familiar with the term calls to action? Yeah, so calls to action, we think of like a big red button on the page, like donate now. Uh, but there's often lots of calls to action on a site, right? You go to a site and there's actually five things that you want the user to do. Um, and maybe you want them to do them all at once on the same page. Um, and so this actually, I think that a lot of the time it happens that there's a lot of calls to action on the page because the page starts out in the design as being this big thing where there's room for lots of communication to go on. But as soon as you start looking at the, the mobile version of that content, there's not room to tell the user to do five things. You want to really focus the user's attention on one thing, or maybe two things at once. Um, and so if you're, especially if your design process or your content organization process starts off looking at bigger devices, then that's just not taken into account and you end up just with too much stuff on the page. Um, so starting off thinking mobile is going to really help with that. Um, making the link between the content on the page and the call to action is key. Sometimes you just say, oh, I want the user to, to do this, so I'm just going to give them this big button to do this thing. But there's no link between that and what the, the users do. So they're reading an article uh, on, on the page and then they see a link to, to donate, but there's no correspondence between the two things. Um, so you want to make sure that you're thinking about that, you're thinking about the storytelling, and you're analyzing what the user is actually trying to do on the page and, uh, and what you want the user to do. And if there's a link between those things, then that's where the call to action comes into play. Uh, and of course, Drupal is really flexible with how you place blocks on a page. You don't have to put the same big red button on every single page. You can make it contextual. So it's very simple in Drupal to place blocks contextually. 
Um, and so you can, in that way, reduce the number of things that you're, you're pushing on the user. Um, so using calls to action might be a good way to highlight the most important navigation items so that you're not relying on the user going through all the navigation links. Uh, so one example of this, well here's actually a big red button. <laughs> so uh, donate, obviously that's what the Canadian Red Cross wants us to do. Um, and here like there's a donate button, maybe it's a couple times but it's a very consistent design. Um, and just in terms of content strategy, when they're, when they're placing this on pages, they're not also adding a whole bunch of other things that they want us to do. They're really just simplifying the content and, and making it clear. Uh, slideshows. So often what happens when there's more than one thing you want users to do, um, someone says, oh, we should make a slideshow so that we can tell the users to do five things. And, They'll just see all these things in the slideshow and then they'll click on the one that they want to do. It seems like such a great idea. Um, <laughs> but this is something that you can avoid happening and maybe the time to do it is like at the content strategy phase of the project before you even get to design. So before you allow the designer to come to this conclusion that you need a slideshow to fit in all the calls to action, you can kind of, you can kind of limit that before it starts. So, uh, slideshows have their way of creeping into websites, but just some rules of thumb about <laughs> how firm you should be at saying no. Um, you should avoid slideshows slide for key communication. So if something has to be communicated to the user, do not put it in a slideshow because maybe they won't see it because they're on a different slide or they don't click the next button. Um, so adding something to a slideshow basically means it's probably not going to be accessible to everyone, and someone's not going to see it. Um, you can look for alternatives. So even if it's just image content, maybe making a small uh, gallery of thumbnails or some kind of other presentation of that data might be useful. And so slideshows really, if you're going to use them, should be limited to supplementary information. So if you've got some visuals that you're adding to kind of show off how nice something looks, that could be thrown into a slideshow, but it's not like the key data. And then, of course, not using auto advance, using control. Like, those are all good. Just real with them. So, slideshows, like for this, not such a, not such a great idea. Here, the call to action kind of remains in place um, while the content changes, so maybe that's more acceptable, but still probably not, not a great idea. Um, way of making the, the content consistent. Um, applications like this, having slideshows for more just visual content, probably more acceptable, although you can also, of course, always do some kind of gallery uh, solution. Okay, so media. So we've got, um, We've got our content strategy going, we're talking about making content really granular, planning our menus really well, having well-placed calls to action. Um, and then we also are always gonna have some kind of media content on the site. So we're gonna have images and we might have some videos. And how are we gonna make sure that those, that those work well? So just like with other content, you have a separation with with images in Drupal between the actual images that users are uploading to the site and the way that the images are displayed. So for those of you who have been using Drupal, uh, you know that there is image styles in Drupal that we can use when we're displaying the images to change the, the display. So we can change the size, we can change the proportions, we can change the aspect ratio, we can darken and lighten. There's all kinds of effects that we can add to images. Um, but the actual images that are uploaded, that's what's key, that's our raw data. So if you're having your authors create thousands of pieces of content, the last thing you want to do is to have to, to, have to re-upload all of that image content because you change how it looks, because there's some new device. Um, so you want to make sure that you're really planning ahead for different devices when you're creating these images in the first place. Um, so you want to add the, the treatments, 
resizing of images just on the display. So that includes things like adding overlays. You don't want to be adding that to the actual raw content. You want to be adding that through CSS or through some kind of uh, image processing. Um, on large devices, make sure you're optimizing your images. So one thing that comes up with, um, with having a website that works on multiple devices is that there's this assumption that on large devices, we don't need to optimize as much. Because surely on a large device, you have a great internet connection and you can you know, display these massive images that look awesome. Um, so it, ten it tends to be that on mobile people have worse connections, but it could be that I'm using my laptop at a conference. I haven't used the Wi-Fi for yet, but maybe it's less than ideal, or maybe I'm on a zero training, you know? <laughs> but that massive image the designer put up is just taking forever to load. So you want to make sure that you're optimizing images everywhere. Um, so for Drupal 8, there is a responsive image module, and this is getting more into the, the technical or design details, but it's uh, important for you to know. So who here has used the responsive image module? Yeah, so it's a module you should, for sure, um, be, be using, and what it does is it's going to allow you to have different, different sizes of image load for different uh, sizes of screen. So if you're on a really big screen, you could load that larger image, um, but load something smaller to optimize the, the site further for, for smaller screens. Um, but again, you don't want to just rely on that and have the massive image always if it's not needed. Um, you want to make sure that your images are only as big as they need to be. Um, media guidelines, okay, so I also have there. Don't autoplay audio and video. Um, you want to make sure that you're not, again, assuming that somebody on a, on a larger device wants to or has the bandwidth to play a video. Maybe they're tethering off their phone and they don't want to use all their data on, on your little quirky video. Um, and then using video thumbnails, so instead of actually loading a whole player, just displaying the thumbnail so that the user can pick if they're consuming that video. That's, that's a, a good rule of thumb. So these are kind of best practices that we can take from mobile and also apply to, to, our, to our other devices. So displaying smaller images. Responsive image is pretty easy to set up. It is a separate module, and you just you can integrate it with your theme. You can have different uh, sizes that you define in your theme, and those will integrate right into the, the module. Okay, so cleaning up legacy content. So this is like a super fun topic. Who here has had to clean up legacy content from an old site? Yeah, when I think of content strategy, this is actually the first thing I think of now. <laughs> it's like the less fun part. It's like, oh, we're designing this brand new Drupal site and the content strategy is going to be amazing. But I have, you know, 10,000 old pages just written in Kansas and HTML that doesn't fit at all with the new, the new structure. So this is the reality of, of content strategy and can be particularly challenging for devices because a lot of legacy content was not written with, um, with mobile in mind. Uh, so key, the, the key, um, the key, what do we call this, culprits <laughs> in terms of uh, legacy content tend to be things like fixed with tables, uh, media that's just included in your HTML, and having um, a lot of styling within the content. So sometimes if you're looking at legacy HTML and you look at the source, you'll see all, the, all these uh, CSS, inline CSS styles that have been added to float content. So particularly things that create some kind of layout, if that's defined in the HTML, in the actual content HTML, that can be a real challenge to deal with, especially if it's been done in different ways throughout the content, so you don't have a consistent thing to, uh, to convert. Um, and so one of the key things that you're often trying to do with legacy content is take all that unstructured HTML and convert that into structured content. 
Um, so if you can find patterns, that will allow you to maybe even script the, the process to take that unstructured content and put it into content types. But often that's not possible because usually if the contents are written with a ZZWIG editor or been written by hand, there's not that consistency there. So often this is something that actually has to be done uh, by hand. So normally when we're, we're doing this for a project, um, and I have my colleagues are presenting tomorrow on a case study uh, for Princeton University Press, who've just gone through the process of doing this for a lot of their legacy content. And what we had to do is we had to prioritize the high visibility content. So you say, okay, there's uh, you know 20,000 pages on the site, uh, and of those, there's like maybe a thousand pages of static HTML to convert. So that's too many pages for us to, to go through by hand, but let's take the top 200, 300 pages that are viewed most often, and let's make sure that we're prioritizing those in terms of cleaning up the content. Uh, so prioritization is important, uh, and one challenge with prioritization is that when you're taking a bunch of legacy content and moving it into a new system, the pages that people look at might change, because maybe in the old system you have these pages that were hidden away and maybe they're going to be highlighted. So you just have to make sure that the content people are actually using, that that's what you're, you're taking a look at and analyzing. Uh, so this is just an example from that project. Uh, where there were a lot of pages, like uh, static, static HTML pages with tables hard-coded that then on mobile look really, uh, well, don't look maybe that great even not on mobile, <laughs> but particularly on mobile, they look really switched because of the, the table structure. Um, and so that's where you're looking at actually manually going in and converting that from tables to some kind of a, a, grid, a grid system. Um, so it's a good opportunity to, uh, like in terms of doing your content audit, this is when you probably want to come up with some kind of standards for that static content. So even if you're not able to convert um, your big static pages into more structured content, because uh, maybe it's not possible to figure out the patterns of uh, fields for a thousand static pages, uh, at least having more consistent HTML is going to be better. So for example, um, uh, if there's a certain uh, criteria you want to have for creating lists or creating tables, uh, or when someone should use a bootstrap grid to lay out the content, um, those are the kind of guidelines you can come up with during your content audit to ensure that consistency. So just to summarize, wrap up. Um, so first rule of thumb, create granular content. That's a great place to start, especially with things that really make sense as, as your content types. Uh, don't shy away from creating really distinct specific fields for your content and trying to fit your content into that structure. Um, cleaning up WYSIWYG generated HTML. So that's, uh, that's harder than it sounds, obviously, but uh, if you're able to limit how WYSIWYG is used, it's going to actually avoid those problems in the future, so that would be a great strategy to implement. Um, planning your mobile navigation, so don't plan your navigation and then at the last minute say, oh yeah, let's do it on mobile. Make sure that you, you understand that your navigation is going to be displayed on mobile, so make sure that works that it's going to work for that context. Uh, optimizing media on the web, so making sure you've got the right raw data and uh, adapting it well. And then uh, simplifying your, your landing pages and calls to action. So calls to action, like there's some landing pages on your site where you might have a lot of things going on. And uh, so trying to simplify that and uh, taking, taking a look at those pages on the web at the beginning of the, the process is going to help. Uh, and then finally, doing user testing on mobile. So I know some projects like uh, user testing does, does happen. Um, how about user testing? 
<laughs> expert right here taking my photo. Um, but how often does that happen on mobile? I don't know. Like, uh, even though everyone knows that people use their phones all the time, um, it's not necessarily the first thing you think of when you're doing user testing. So just watching somebody browsing through your site on a mobile device is going to happen. Um, and that's probably something you want to do maybe at the beginning of the process. So if you're creating a new site um, and you're going through the content, that's the point at which maybe you should be doing the user testing and, and seeing what should be prioritized in terms of, of content. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, are there any comments or questions or things I've missed? Everyone's like, I'm gonna have lunch, it's 12 15. <laughs> they just give me breakfast. <laughs> so I have um, just a list here of the upcoming trainings in case you're interested. These are more advanced than what I've covered now. This is a pretty high level session. Um, and if you're interested in more on that, um, the case study for Princeton and knowing exactly how we did that content audit, that's mostly what my colleagues are gonna be talking about tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so, It'd be great to see you there. Yes? How do you deal with a client that pushes back on your recommendations for your content structure or any other things to talk about? Yeah, so for sure, people push back. What do people push back on? Simplification. Uh, it's really hard to get users to simplify their content. And to be honest, sometimes it's because it's, you know, it's not possible. It's really hard because they have a, maybe a, an existing site with a lot of Content. So that tends to be the biggest thing. Um, the other thing is deleting things. Like if you've done the content audit, um, you know how hard it is to get anyone to agree to remove content. So really coming up with good terminology there and saying, okay, we're going to archive this, so we're going to remove it, or like actually going through and doing the work for them and saying, okay, here's what we've highlighted for removal. Please approve this, <laughs> rather than having them like click that delete button because it can be hard, especially if they're the one who wrote all that content. Um, <laughs> um, uh, a lot of a lot of sites, in terms of content, I didn't talk too much about this, but a lot of them have a, you know a lot of PDFs, a lot of documents that are not really accessible and not really appropriate for uh, 2017. Um, and so those things can be really hard to get, get removal on to. Um, and then just seeing the value in spending time on this. So this is something that, you, you know, we kind of just bake this into our, our projects in a way, um, because, you know, content strategy is something you have to do. Um, but it's not always something that's uh, seen as important, or it's not something that the client, like, identifies, like, yeah, we need to do content strategy. Like, no, they just want to get their website done. So we kind of have to, to build this into the process. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of not all the time video, how do you reconcile that with the third game marketing trends and put those videos to see the big girl on top of your own? Yeah, who has that on their website? The auto training video? <laughs> I was working on a website once that that had it and for some reason like I just walk around the office and people would be looking at the website and they're all like looking at the website, like the video. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I guess some of those videos are less distracting than others. So I would say like, maybe that actually the video selection is, is going to be useful. Like some of them seem more decorative and some of them actually like take all your attention. Um, and then for sure that like, you shouldn't do that unless it's a big screen, right? Like, so uh, when I've done that, uh, on a mobile the phone, it basically tells it and then hits the play button, it doesn't all the play. Right. So um, within the context of what you're saying, you know, respecting the mobile, you know, needs and so on, back in the, is that a legitimate thing? I mean, I don't know if I'll be connected to the time of consumption to know if that's just a use of all the data or if it's only like press play. play. Yeah, that's a great question. It'd be, it'd be nice to be able to say, yeah, if you're, if the user is bandwidth is less than X, then don't auto play. Yeah, so the launch code may also be very tricky to control, but that's going to be the way to get 
can help them as we come to And then all of the different workshops will help. So I'll let them help. Yeah. So in, in the case where, you know, it doesn't all the play, but it does sort of all the load, right. and you should play about it. Is it actually like that? Thanks very much for being here today.